Hi, I'm Keith McCullough, and welcome back to The Anchor, the uh, Liz Ann Saunders part of the show, which everyone's been looking forward to. Your questions are already coming through the Q&A, so please keep those coming. Uh, I'm going to go back and forth with Liz Ann on macro topics, and then we'll take your questions shortly thereafter that. But uh, everyone's asking you already about this yield curve thing, you know? You're like, it's history. It's, it's <laughs> actually normally what happens when you get toward the end of a cycle. So uh, yeah, there, there's nothing terribly unique about it happening this But time. everyone panics about these things, don't they? Is it because it's new or it's the latest thing to talk about? Or? It's been a long time since it was last inverted. Right. So you have to go back to mid-2007, which was at the end of the inversion that began in 2006. So it is by far in the modern era the longest period we've gone without an inversion, mm -hmm. but that's tied to the fact that this is the, if we get to July without a recession, it'll be the longest expansion since then. But, you know, it's sort of the natural order of things. Yep. Uh, when, when the Fed tightens policy, then they back away and the long end starts to discount the coming downturn and you invert the yield curve and a recession comes and you start all over again. <laughs> yeah, and you, you went through this in, in, in great detail. I think you went through the last seven yeah. in your most recent note. Yep. And, and like you said, it's history, but people have a hard time separating the cycle and this idea of a recession with the actual returns in their portfolio. Can you talk right. a little bit about that and the variance? So of, I think because every recession has been preceded by an inverted yield curve, there, there's something that does, I think, to the, the psyche when it comes to the point of inversion, even though all you have to do is simply look back at the data to see that the combination of the lag time between an initial inversion and the yep. recession is, is variable, but also the returns that occur not only in that time span from a stock market perspective, but in and around the entire end of the cycle is also quite variable. Mm -hmm. I think maybe the, the added rub this time is that there, there's so much more money that is driven by and triggered off of you know micro things that happen, even just you know yep. the algos that are tied to words that appear. And I think you might have seen some sort of triggering occur that that causes some momentum trading mm -hmm. off of that initial move uh, to an inversion, mm -hmm. which of course is what happened to the day on uh, on Friday. So that's that's an added little tricky aspect to the n nature of m sort of machine driven trading that exists in this environment, which would not have been the case, you know, in many cycles prior to that. Yeah, it's very quick. I mean, we've, we can see them now one to three days a month is literally when a factor exposure tilts. And this would be, this would be, be a, a trivial factor. I mean, yield curve inversion, but it would also be something that's already been observed throughout the year. You've had inversion in parts of the curve. Right, exactly. And people end, yep. can, can either freak out about it or not. But what I like about your notes and how you think about the world in general is that you know, there are things that led up to that moment right. on Friday. Right. It didn't just happen, okay, today is the day that the machines are gonna care about that factor exposure. There was actually a pretty decisive uh, decision by the Fed. Uh, d decision by the Fed. Uh, which was not just the decision around going into pause mode, which they, the 180 they did from December to January, but the decision announcement they made about the balance sheet. Right. Um, not just the, the, the runoff broadly, but um, taking the runoff of mortgage-backed securities and moving them into treasuries, which is almost a kind of a de facto pseudo QE thing. So I think <laughs> de facto pseudo. Well, it, it, <laughs> it is because you're you'll ultimately sort of boost the yeah. the amount of treasuries in the portfolio, and then you you add to that the incredible weakness that we've seen outside the United States and yeah. the the, the uh, you know PMI report we got out of Germany on Friday, horrendous. Which you already were in sort of negative yielding territory across uh, parts of the rest of the world, which boosts demand for treasuries, mm -hmm. which in turn, when you boost demand for something, it boosts the price and brings the yield down. So the combination of what the, the Fed did, both on the, the rate part of the decision tree, but also uh, the balance sheet. Mm -hmm. And then you look at weakness in U.S. growth and weakness in global growth and the impact that that had on buying interest in, in treasuries. And you, you, know, you, know, you mix it all together, and that's a recipe for, for an inversion. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's like in fractal math, you just called a similar set. You get things that happen, bing, bing, bing. Okay. Yep. Fed goes dovish three times. Then you get incrementally more dovish data in Europe. I mean, that data in Europe actually what really ticked them down yeah. um, yep. on the global side. Yep. And you inverted the German tenure. Yep. Well, I mean, the curve's been inverted, but the tenure was negative, uh, as you know. And you've had, right, to your point, you've had, a, you know, portions of the U.S. yield curve already inverted. In fact, 
the, the, you know, the, the near forward curve, which is you know, six quarters out expectation for the three month bill yield minus the three month bill yield, yep. uh, which in a paper less than a year ago in June of 2018, written by two Fed economists came out and said that they found that to be the curve that was most predictive of recessions. That inverted in January, kind of steepened a little bit out of inversion and then back yep. into inverted territory for you know, a decent chunk of the first quarter so far. Mm -hmm. To me, as I put in my report today, if you know, the Fed itself is telling you that this is the most predictive curve, you probably want to pay attention to it at least somewhat yeah. relative to maybe the more you know, traditional curves like the 10-year, three-month, or 10-year, two-year. Yeah, year. They, they, they've, done, they've actually done a masterful job laying out what they're staring at, however late that might be. I mean, we're talking about very late, them yeah. going from hawkish rate hike to three, I, I call them a triple dovish pivot. I mean, you basically, Powell's gone dovish three times incrementally yeah, since right, the rate hike. Right. So now you got that and you're laying down the railway tracks and what does this Fed look like when the curve's inverted? Don't they have to just cut? Well, I, you know, the market is telling you that there's a 60% likelihood of a, of a cut this year. Yeah, that and, went up in a hurry. <laughs> you know, I, I think the only scenario under which the Fed probably has to hike here would not be a great scenario for risk assets because it Raising probably rates. means a stagflationary type of environment. Yeah. So if somehow you see the tightness of the labor market move into more traditional measures of inflation and you get that in conjunction with a still slowing economy, it's kind of, again, worst case scenario, yeah. um, if to the extent it forces the Fed to move. Now, the other part of it, although they did not move with any formality toward that price level targeting, which had been rumored, mm -hmm. but to the extent that in their, their head they're thinking, we've gone through such an extended period where inflation has been below target, maybe we let it run hot, which tells you that if that's their thinking, that even if inflation, core levels of inflation pick up beyond their target, I don't think that in and of itself is going to cause them to, to rush to, no. to raise interest rates, which means a cut is still the more likely scenario. But you can't rule out um, that other scenario. What we've been saying is I think the, the, the sweet spot for the Fed, the diameter of it has gotten a bit narrower. You know, earlier in the cycle, you talk about it in quads, I talk about it in the phases of the cycle. Earlier in the cycle, when you're coming out of a recession mm -hmm. in the early stages of recovery, sweet spot's much wider. Yep. Fed's tightening, but they don't have to worry <laughs> about choking off the recovery because you're earlier in the cycle, you're just reflating. Now I think it's just a little tighter a scenario. There's sort of extremes on both ends of the spectrum, I think, that, that could trip up risk assets, which, again, is not abnormal at this point uh, in the cycle. And in the meantime, what they end up with is the real risk asset are the banks they're trying to protect. I mean, this was not a trivial move in the financials last week. You get the financials down 4.8% of the week. Utilities make an all-time high. Great for Captain Quad 3 here because that's the setup. You know, when you're in Quad 3 stagflation, you don't buy the financials. Curve continues to compress. Yields actually should start to, or I should say, yield spread starts to widen again. We didn't get that last we week, right. actually. Right. Um, but the financials are in a tough spot because the Fed puts them in a tough spot. And I don't know how, like me being a short seller of the financials and a buyer of utilities, there's no fundamental reason for me to change that position unless somebody like you or somebody that actually has credibility on calling the cycle says, well, what you should be looking for ahead is this. No, we, w we wouldn't disagree with you. I mean, we don't, we don't play the short game at Schwab, yeah. obviously. So our, our tactical recommendations at the sector level are just sort of outperform yep. or not. And, and we, not only financials, but also technology in August of last year, we had had, well, we had had technology as an outperform for an extended period of time. time. Financials for also a fairly long period of time, but, l mm -hmm. but less long than, uh, than te technology. We downgraded both of those mm -hmm. um, to kind of market weight. You know, in hindsight, it would have been ideal at certain times in the, the last several months to have been uh, yeah, you know, underperformed, but, yeah. but On the certainly, certainly happy to have not been. <laughs> and I think also what's, what's telling about recent leadership in the market, to your point about utilities, is that this notion that we're going to be fine in the economy is, is not borne out by what has been happening internally to the stock market. When you look at what's happened to yeah. the defensive areas getting a lift and, and areas like the transports getting uh, getting hit, this tells you that something is, uh, is a problem in the economy. Well, that's, the, I mean, and you deal slowing. with this like I do. I mean, we have to both deal with, you know, a lot of questions from people. Yep. Uh, Clients have, I mean, they're under this intense pressure on year-to-date performance, but year-to-date performance is not a trending reality. Right. We're not even three months into the year. Right. If you pull back six months, 
And you look at the returns by asset class, subsector exposure, anything going back six months, they're dramatically different than year to date. Mm -hmm. So how much of that like do you get in terms of, oh my God, I'm missing this stock market move, it's the end of February, what do I do, Lizanne? Is it all priced in? I mean, I get these questions, I'm sure you get them 10,000 times over. You know what, I, we don't find it as much because, you know, for all intents and purposes, our, our client base are individual investors. Mm -hmm. They're not buy side institutions. Mm -hmm. And even the advisor side of our business, advisor services as we call it, which sometimes is generically referred to as the institutional side of our business, are independent RIAs on yeah. our platform whose clients are mostly individual investors. Right. The good news from that perspective is they don't they don't really focus on sort of calendar year against a benchmark kind of return. Mm -hmm. Which is awesome. <laughs> Which is awesome, except that the other problem about benchmarks is they generally have the S&P, whatever time period, they generally have the S&P as their upside benchmark. But then when the market turns and you go into a corrective phase, the benchmark moves from being the S&P to cash, yep. to a positive rate of return. Mm -hmm. So you know, that, that's the rub, is they, they, they never want to lose money. And when the market is doing well, they want to beat the S&P. It's sort of a, a, an impossible um, goal to meet. But we don't tend to have clients that are so year-to-date yeah. focus, so you don't tend to see the kind of window dressing mentality that kicks in in the latter part of the year. And again, December was a brutal uh, environment for, for our clients heading into yeah. Christmas Eve and seeing that. And we, we saw activity on the part of our clients that really didn't differ much from what you saw broadly when you look at ETF flows and, and fund flows. Mm -hmm. The good news from my perspective, at least maybe relative good news, is that we haven't seen the optimism come back uh, in so, so far this year as we did going into the September highs or what we had seen coming into the beginning of 2018 mm -hmm. where you know January December of 17 January of 2018 was like somebody just flipped a switch and it went from years and years and years of skepticism and pessimism and not believing in the bull market to just silly silliness. Yeah, let's just grip it and rip it. And yeah. and it came back pretty quickly yeah. into the September highs too. It, yeah. the, the optimism has been a bit more subdued uh, this time. Yeah, especially for and I, and I hate calling them the the retail community because it really doesn't do them credit. I mean, retail investors that's that's what people call them on TV. But the reality is they're the rich people in this country. They're the people with the money and they're the people that are funding hedge funds and giving assets to pension for or to mutual funds that are, you know, th these, these people are actually some of the sharpest that I've come to know now that we've built out that side of the business. Like our fastest part of the business in terms of its growth is that RIA channel. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because they're like, okay, I'm unwilling to listen to the old wall, right. so to speak. Yep. Um, can you imagine the old wall told you to sell treasuries in October? Yeah. I mean, that, that's the worst asset allocation move maybe in the modern times. And many of these RIAs were the old wall. You know, right. they were inside the big investment banking firms and right. they're now breakaway brokers yeah. um, for a variety of reasons, the way they wanted to manage yeah. their own business, but also what their investors were mm -hmm. ultimately demanding uh, uh, in terms of how their money was being managed. And that's where it comes from. I mean, it's the people with the money that are demanding the change. Yep. So you, if you left the wirehouse or if you left uh, Merrill and now you're on independent you know, platform doing it, however you're going to do it, your, your task is to take share from the old wall. It's to find a better way. And what I'm finding is actually a lot of individuals are starting to understand asset allocation, oh, yeah. macro ETFs, yep. Um, sector rotation in a timely way, just expressing their broader asset allocation. You've never been able to do it with this kind of a cost structure, and you've certainly not been able to do it with this kind of liquidity. So maybe that's it too. I don't know if you see this. I think it's a big part of it. In fact, we, we do. I believe it's an annual broad ranging survey of our investors. And one of the things that we found was those of our investors that take what we would generically call an advised approach, they're not just do-it-yourself kind of trading online. Right. They actually, whether it's with an outside advisor or maybe you know, a private client advisor, they're taking a disciplined approach to investing that involves broad strategic asset allocation and mm -hmm. diversification across asset classes and taking advantage of what, you know, at least at Schwab, we, we like to take at least some credit for having democratized investing for the public. Big time. Um, <laughs> and we found that those that take a more disciplined approach uh, have, have better outcomes and they don't tend to panic as much during mm -hmm. some of the big moves. And panic can happen in both directions. You can panic in and you can panic out. Mm -hmm. um, so we have found that those that are taking almost that endowment approach to managing uh, their money and availing themselves of the ability to be more diversified and have yep. exposure across asset classes and in alternative areas that maybe weren't accessible to them in the past 
end up um, with with a better outcome long term. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's for me. I mean, I'm, it's not talking my own book because I'm not running a book, but the four quadrant process. That's the number one thing, Lizanne, that people care about, is that it's a process. Right. It's a process, okay, I understand the process, and incidentally, it's been working since I started paying attention, but it gets more interesting when my process isn't working. Like, who are the people panicking in? Who are the people panicking out? And to me, that's actually provided me with a, a better understanding of my own process, if that makes sense, because I actually have to teach it more simply, teach people how to have patience with it. Again, go back to the incremental you know, economic data that's driving the process. Uh, but it's been kind of humbling, in the, it's been quite humbling in the last year to see more and more people say, okay, look, this is better than what I was doing before which is, again, I'm just you know, flipping around right. emotionally sort of almost. It, right. yep. um, so, so to me, that's been interesting. Uh, let's go back to that, uh, which is a lot of people still think that the sell-off in the fourth quarter really had nothing to do other than the Fed going hawkish. I mean, uh, to, to me, I can go back and I can show you every single time that the Fed has tightened into quad four, quad three, stuff goes completely bananas, like in a wrong way. Now, and, and if I went through every single data point in our predictive tracking algorithm, which includes everything in GDP that you would know, mm -hmm. obviously, the rate of change started slowing in October, then again in November, yep. then again in December, yep. and we still continue to slow. So growth slowing has indeed been the causal factor yep. all along. Yep. And I still see a lot of people say, oh, that was a one-off, it's all priced in, including the earnings slowdown, which also peaked, you know, at least I think, peaked in the third quarter. You, you saw you saw the the peak in the leading indicators in September. Uh, you saw within a month or two in either direction almost all the subcomponents of the leading index roll over. Right. You saw the significant tightening of financial conditions, which was one of the contributors to the rolling over in earnings expectations for 2019. That was another factor that I think made this environment somewhat unique. Is there the last earnings recession we had was second two quarters, last two quarters of 2015, first two quarters of 2016. 16, yeah. It was almost solely driven by the, the prior collapse in oil prices. So most of the hit was to the energy sector. There's so many hits to earnings looking ahead in 2019. The simple math of the way year over year comps work when you have a tax cut passed into 2018, you don't have it again in 2019. So there was a simple math problem mm -hmm. that existed. You saw the strength in the dollar, the impact on exports. You saw weak global growth, especially in Europe, which is a bigger driver of S&P sales than, than mm -hmm. China. You obviously had the, the trade war with China and you had the collapse in oil prices. And it was almost like the analyst community was only able to sort of look at each of those individually and say, okay, we have to cut because of the trade war. Now we gotta look, we gotta cut because of, of energy. And that's why from April of last year, when you started seeing published consensus estimates for 2019, they were still fairly high. Then it started, you start, saw the hit to the first quarter, then you saw the hit to the second quarter. Yeah. And you're now in negative territory for Q1 and barely, barely. barely positive <laughs> for, for Q2 yeah. and Q3. And the tighter financial conditions meant that even though we saw strong earnings last year, you saw compression in multiples last year, until recently we've seen the opposite this year. You kind of got a, li a multiple lift because financial conditions loosened. I just think we're getting to the point now where earnings are gonna, you're gonna have to see some semblance of decent surprises because you're not gonna get a macro sort of tailwind behind uh, multiples anymore. You can get a multiple lift the wrong way. You can have the e -fall You could get it, a multiple lift the wrong is, way. Which exactly. is actually <laughs> quite typical of this stage of the cycle, whether I go back to, you know, people bought stocks on, at the beginning of 2001 and then faded like a flower as earnings did. Same thing in 2008. You guys, show us slide uh, 70 just to show exactly what Lizanne just pointed out. I mean, it's it's great to be able to talk to somebody who knows every number inside out and <laughs> through really? the back of your where, head. Where, but I mean, where are they? <laughs> you know, exactly. Not me. <laughs> but right here, this is what, um, if you don't mind, I'm just going to circle what you just said. So if we go back to um, 2000 or in 2016, what Lizanne was trying to say here is exactly what happened. So earnings in the aggregate, in the S&P 500, they're negative, negative. That's That was basically the bottom. But there was a, a large swath of energy, materials, industrials that drove that. Yep. You still, again, you had positive earnings throughout parts of the period. But then once you got into this part of last year, these are numbers that we haven't seen since 2001 or 2000, right at the very peak. And again, those are, in my vernacular, in rate of change terms, those are the uncompable comps. I mean, I don't know. Look at where Bloomberg estimates are. Actually, they just popped up this week. Now they're expecting positive in Q1 by one but it's magically gonna reaccelerate by Q4. I mean, the, I, I have earnings down like seven to 9% throughout the second and the third quarter year over year. So that's how I think of, you know, you can get a more expensive market on the way down. Right. And 
I can't for the life of me understand here. Like, look at something like this. Look at the financials is in, which I, I, I don't like, obviously. Financials went from 31% growth to three in the last two quarters. 30 to three. And they haven't even comped the tough comps yet. Right. Like, what is Jamie Dimon, what are they going to do in the third quarter? You could have, financials could have earnings that look a lot like the stocks did last week. So now you've got an interesting narrative that actually fits the profile of what Mr. Markets told you, which is you don't buy stocks ahead of an earnings right. recession. Right. So how much of that, let's just say that there's some chance, and I want to hear if you agree with me or not, if earnings are down 5 to 10% year over year, like the precedent for that is buy stocks or not? Um, ahead of it happening. I think if, if this were an instance where we could get an earnings recession absent an economic recession, um, at some point, the market becomes viable. I just don't think we're likely to see those two divorce this time. Really? Okay. Uh, yeah, I think. Well, first of all, to say we're getting a recession, to me, that's duh. <laughs> so, I don't know why that is seen as some bombastic out there view. That's what happens at the end of a cycle. You get a recession. Um, we're all, we'd all love to know the length of runway between now and the next recession. But um, and, I, and I do think, uh, and I have no greater insight on this than anybody else does, but I, I, I think trade is an important needle mover um, because one of the things that really faltered in the last six to nine months was sort of the soft economic data, the yep. business confidence, the animal spirits getting deflated. And if you, you want to sort of look for the next leg of the economic cycle to the extent we're not at the end of this one, it would be an economy that morphs from consumer-centric to CapEx-centric. Mm -hmm. And I just don't see how you reignite the CapEx cycle without a reflating of animal spirits, which I think only comes with not just any trade deal, mm -hmm. but some semblance of a comprehensive yep. uh, trade deal. Yep. Uh, other than that, I think a recession is sooner than the consensus believes. I mean, that's interesting. I mean, people don't really go to that often, but they should. I mean, it's just reversing our bull case from the prior three years. I think you and I were right in sync with it because the data was. Yep. U.S. growth was hashtag accelerating yep. and had a big kicker with yep. CapEx and yep. tax reform. Yep. Um, if you guys go to slide uh, CapEx just to show that slide on year over year, I think that's on slide uh, 36, guys. Um, but this, I, maybe this is worth you just commenting on because I think most people that don't look at these time series, they wouldn't know. I mean, it's, it's like I always say in macro these days, it's like bridging the gap between ignorance and awareness. You either know history like you do or you do not. And now if you do not, you're going to learn, right? So CapEx was up 10% mm -hmm. year over year versus mm -hmm. minus six at the bottom. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard to contextualize how low that was and how high that was, but it both happened in the same window. Right. You know, how, how, like, how likely is it that CapEx isn't running in the low single digits to maybe flat to negative? Again, uh, unless it is a true comprehensive trade deal that I think would have to address some of the more sort of egregious practices on, on China's part. There's kind of a secondary set of questions. Yeah. If there is something like that, okay, what's the monitoring mechanism? What's the enforcement mechanism? So you've got side questions that come from that. But also I would think have to include a, a, a pulling back of the tariffs that are already in place and then not turning the attention to Europe and, and going after European automakers. I, I just think the, the without um, a really positive trade scenario, I just don't see what reignites things like capital spending intention yeah. plans and all of those forward-looking yeah. survey-based data points, which, you know, in fairness to companies, it, it's been a perfectly rational decision to, to take very low interest rates on the part of the Fed, borrow money to, to buy back your stock. There's not much incentive to go out the risk spectrum and make long-term capital investment decisions, mm -hmm. especially given that their competitors aren't doing it. So I, I just, uh, barring, and I think trade is a big part of it, yeah. a, a huge part of that, reigniting those animal spirits. Without it, I, I think we're, we're still on this Well, that's slide. the other big thing that I thought I saw on Friday. I mean, it was a reaction to global PMI data. Usually people aren't that in tune with that kind of data, but people are now saying, okay, the, the, talk, the, the clock's ticking. China either comes out of this and Europe comes out of this sooner than later or not. Or not. And or not, is a big problem. It is. You know, because, it's a very big problem. as you know, China and Europe and EM have been slowing for over a year yep. now. I mean, that's that's not a new story. Yep. And global trade has been um, quite weak yep. uh, recently, and that uh, that that that's tied. That's highly correlated to um, earnings for the S and P, but globally as well. And I just the uh, it's it's hard for me to to get my arms around 
the case that some are still making that, that this is an incredibly strong economy and that we're going to be just fine. You just, you just don't see it in the data. And you and I talk <laughs> about this all the time. It's, it's, it's that you know, better or worse matters more than good or bad when it comes to the economic data. Yep. And I think sometimes, certainly Main Street investors are often somewhat myopic when it comes to looking at the data and they see it in good versus bad or strong versus weak. Right. So even things like the leading economic index, you could say, well, the level is still fairly high, yeah. but it's the trend that matters. Mm -hmm. And GDP, well, we had 2.6 for fourth quarter. Well, it's purely backward looking. Mm -hmm. That's probably going to be revised down. And it's those subtle shifts. Sometimes it's, you need to be as simplistic, I think, as pointing out to people, look at any measure of economic data at the peak in 2000. Mm -hmm. It looked fantastic. <laughs> look at any set of economic data points in March of 2009. Universally, they looked horrible. Yeah. But we know that those were inflection points. No, exactly. The market tends to sniff out those inflection points by paying attention to the rate of change. Yeah, absolutely. It's not this inanimate thing that sits around until the data <laughs> is bad. And that's, so that's one of the, the sort of education messages we're always yeah. trying to, to talk to investors about, especially when you get to those ends or beginnings of cycles. Well, it's inanimate. <laughs> that's a great way to describe it. Look at slide 30, guys, just to show exactly what you said. When this thing is as bright red as you can get, you buy stocks. And it's, when it's as green as a Christmas tree on December the 24th, which was not the stock market this year, you buy, you, know, you sell a living you know, daylights out of it. Yeah, well, and it's like, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. You know, Q3-18, this is every line item that ticks my nowcast and GDP up or down. Mm -hmm. That's ticking, I'm at 1.22% for Q1. So you're going to go, guys, flip it to sl slide 14. Um, you're going to go from headline 4 to headline 3 to headline 2 with a revision to headline 1. I mean, that, that's... Um, that's, that's what GDP just did. I mean, yeah. so even the GDP numbers, which is not exactly the best way you know, no. to, to get ahead of the market, no. it's just telling you what you already know. Right. Yep. So I mean, people, people are still in this world of I want to buy stocks if things are good. Actually, what I would, would get me to buy stocks is if the data gets bad faster and then the Fed acts faster. Right. That's what the right. market yeah. just told you, that that's actually the number one catalyst for the market right. is the Fed you, going you down. You sort of shorten the end of the cycle then. Yes. Um, yeah. And he's gone dovish three times in less than three months. I, I was saying this is, they've gone dovish fat, FedEx hasn't even gone do, that dovish that fast. Right. They've only cut earnings twice in three months. So you have like this race between corporate America and the Fed and the market, but at the same time this game of chicken between a lot of short-term performance metrics, which I think has become a little bit of a game of survival. I, I agree. I mean, how many people can really win this game if they play the same hand that they played from October right. to December and have played it the opposite hand January to February, and then had to go back to the other hand here in March. I mean, not many people can make all those No, moves. and it, it, you know, so it's a problem of short-termism, which is blissfully now being talked about sort of by corporations as well, not just something that two people like you and I will talk about as it right. relates to investment time horizons. Uh, but I, I, we, at least with our client base, we're actually seeing an acknowledgement of the short-term forces that drive the market in any kind of given day and intraday and algos, et cetera. But we actually see a, a, a willingness to sort of lengthen time horizons mm -hmm. uh, under the idea that over any reasonably long period of time, there is a connection between fundamentals and prices. But getting the order of things right is, is often where investors get tripped up. Mm -hmm. Where I, I do better is if we stay in the same quadrant for a a longer period of time than just one quarter, <laughs> or or you don't you don't sort of reverse the direction and right. go back and forth. Right. Yeah. I mean, guys, show slide six. I mean, quads one and two is pro growth, so that's pretty simple. Right. We're yep. in there for yep. ten quarters. Pro risk in a row. assets. Yep. Good to go. Yep. But when you go into quad four, deflation or disinflation, yep. and rather, I think actually quad three, where I have us going for the next three quarters. If that to me, well, first of all, it's where there's the most performance dispersion. There's the most alpha to be generated on the long and short side. Right. You know, if I go from asset uh, allocation sectors and factors. So to me, actually, the next three quarters, let's, I, I always go with, let's, God forbid, I'm right. Um, if we're in quad three, uh, I'll go with the quad three hand. And if the data changes, then I'll go to that hand. But how difficult is quad three, like this would commonly be called stagnation or stagflation, okay. where the Fed's trying to prop up oil prices or asset prices, you're getting that, inflation stops going down, but real GDP continues to decline. How hard do you think that'll be for people to navigate that setup? Well, I, I guess it, to some degree, depends on the Fed's reaction function. Uh, you know, so far the, the 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 pressure on inflation has been decidedly down. You've seen some some pockets of where you're yep. seeing core inflation kind of pick up. 
um, in the in the past. If you if you got a bit of a pickup inflation, you would see the Fed react to that. I'm not sure they will do that this time. Um, They'd react hawkishly. Uh, well, I, they they might in words, but I don't think if you got say a quarter's worth of of you know core PCE or core P, or CPI ticking above two percent that they're going to to panic. They yeah. might change the language a little bit. Um, but I guess the the concern would be, and this is what I talked about before with regard to the the sweet spot, if and I would almost throw the question back to you in your quad analysis. What if you have a scenario where economic growth doesn't imminently falter down into recession territory, but kind of continues to roll over? And for whatever reason, you started to see hotter core inflation numbers yeah. because of a continued tightness in the labor market, the skills gap, um, competition for, for skills, all of those reasons. And you really started to see inflation heat up. Is there? Mm -hmm. I, and I wonder myself, is there a scenario where the bond vigilantes that have been yep. sort of snoozing somewhere kind of come back and start to send a message that they're worried the Fed is getting behind the curve again? Yeah, I mean, that, that's if, if the market believes that the Fed's going to do that. I mean, our, my outlook reflects exactly what you just said, by the way. I'll go to slide 15 on the in, on the inflation look. I mean, basically, my call on Treasuries was inflation peaked in the third quarter. It's coming down. Uh, it came down by 100 basis points already, yep. headline. I mean, that gets you paid big time on the long bond. So you go from basically here on inflation to here. That's 100 beeps. And I have, by the fourth quarter, it's going to be more obvious because you compare against the deflation. So your 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 remaining in quad three is barely. Ju right, just barely and just a subtle yeah. uptick in core measures of inflation. But yeah. it's it's subtle in this quarter you know, because it's still, it's still comp the base effects are still not as, as, as easy. But the fourth quarter, you will have unless something changes um, and would have to ch change materially, you'd have to take oil below 40, right. um, then we're going to have a scenario of stagflation, falling real GDP growth and rising headline inflation reports after they bottomed sometime. July was the high print, as you know. So right. you could have this Goldilocks scenario where they're like, look, there's no inflation. That's exactly how Powell was able to say what he said. You know, one and a half percent headline inflation, that doesn't concern me. In fact, they want to get it higher than that. So I don't know. I mean, I, 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 to me, I'm just going to stay with quad three anyway. Gold says that that's right. Energy stocks say that that's right. You know, the Fed's going to try to help you. But at some point, the market may say, hey, look, I see your easiness, and I also see my ability to sell the right. next uptick. Right. And I don't know how that's going to look. It'd be tough. It'll be tough. <laughs> Real tough. But economic stagflation is also tough politically. And that's oh, the yeah. other thing that I wanted to, to ask you on is you have... Uh, institutional clients in particular, everyone's talking about the upside associated with China in a trade deal, also associated with the Fed going dovish. We've already had three dovish Fed pivots or incrementally you know, more dovish Fed three times. And the China deal, I don't know what this deal is supposed to be so good or whatever. It's going to be, it's already been announced. You get that. Very few people are saying, what if I truncate tax reform and have a change in the presidential cycle in terms of the office flipping the other way and removing the tax reform? Now we, if this is and, a fourth. And turning the cycle back from a regulatory perspective, exactly. too, which hasn't gotten as much attention. <laughs> that would, if we're in an earnings recession already, which I, I always go to the scenario that I have, and then I say, okay, what could happen after that? I mean, what would happen after that? Um, I, there's a, still, believe it or not, a long way with presidential elections. So I, I just think a lot of questions about where we are in the cycle will be answered before we have to start worrying about the potential for policy shifts. I don't think we just sort of tread water here until we get closer to the meat of the election and start to sort right. of game what the makeup of Congress is, is going to look like. And the, you know, our view come at least into the midterm elections, which was the more relevant concern, was that really under no circumstance would you expect to see sort of a repeal of tax cuts. Um, you might see at least a subtle shift uh, back in the direction of more regulation, not uh, less. Mm -hmm. But um, I think we'll have answers to where we are in the economic cycle and when the next recession begins uh, before uh, we have to start to kind of yeah. look at that with a political that's lens. A, that's basically you know, how I try to answer it too because I have no crystal ball. It's not how I roll anyway. I gotta get through these damn three quad threes and that's how I see it. But if it ends in quad three in an earnings recession, that will be turning the calendar into 2020 and you'll be T minus six months with those conditions. So I do think it's something for people to think about when they're, because some people are still saying, hey, we're going to go back to the all-time highs if the Fed comes back with more cowbell.
Because they'd say that outlook says that the Fed is easy. Right. And you buy stocks, and they're going to go to all-time highs. A lot of people say that, Lizanne. I don't know how often well, you hear that. The, the, one, the one thing I would say, though, when people say, well, the Fed has stopped raising interest rates, they've taken a more dovish tilt, that sort of guarantees that we can push off a recession. But recessions have always come after the Fed's already finished tightening. Exactly. Yeah. That's never not happened. So yeah. we, we can't sort of rewrite the history books of the natural order of things. Uh, you know, the, the Fed t tightens policy until ultimately the yield curve inverts. They stop. You know, you see the discounting that happens on the long end, and then a recession comes. So this notion that because the Fed stops, stopped, that prevents a recession, the Fed has always stopped, mm -hmm. and then we've gotten a recession. Yeah. So Witness 2008, 2001. I mean, it's, you don't have to go back that far. I mean, uh, maybe that's why you and I remember them so well. And there's nothing <laughs> terribly heinous about recessions. I, you know, it's been our view that this next one is likely to be um, a tad more garden variety and not the epic mm -hmm. systemic bubble burst that takes the entire global financial system down with it, a la 07 to 09. Mm -hmm. And that, um, you know, recessions, by the way, during recessions historically, the S&P on average is up. Yeah. Yeah. The, wor the, the worst performance around recessions is the six months leading into recession, mm -hmm. which is another reason, I think, by the people who really look in the numbers why recession char chatter started to pick up in the fourth quarter because that kind of weakness tends to be a, a signal in the past yeah, exactly. and would be in keeping if we are getting a recession starting, I don't know, sometime this year, it would be not inconsistent with what the market was telling you in, in the latter part of the year. Yeah. Well, if it's, guys, go to slide 68 to show the two th and then uh, bring your questions in. By the way, I'll go to your questions next. I mean, I've been I, I, I try not to anchor on any scenario, but since growth was so strong, there's only one other period where I can go back and see the consecutiveness. I'm not talking about the level of growth, I'm right. talking about the rate of change of growth. This is actually better than the 1998 to 2000 yep. period because there was you know, a contiguousness of the quad one and two, 10 in a row. Um, but this is like, as you said, I mean, the, the, the US GDP cycle peaked right here in Q2, Q2 of 2000. GDP went from five to four to three to two to one. Yeah, still not a recession. Right. And if you bought stocks when it was, I guess, uh, mathematically or technically a recession, you would have crushed it. If yep. you bought stocks in early 02, yep. I mean, that made me, even me, a buy sider, smart on the long side because anyone could have bought stocks then. So people, again, I think that they think about that differently. The next chart, two guys, shows the earnings on that, which S&P earnings went from up 22 to minus 18 in four quarters. Like, this is up 22.9 to minus... Like you could be gagging all over yourself yeah. down double digit earnings growth and then you buy stocks. Right. So, I mean, to me, again, it's so dangerous to, to go back and say, well, this is just like, but people want us to do that, do they not? They want us to give them the security blanket that, oh, Lizanne, this is like, uh, give me the year. And then, they, and then they feel better. They, they do, <laughs> except what, what our overarching message is, is that investing should never be about get in and get out. That, uh, in fact, I, I get the question, certainly by the financial media, it's posed that way all the time. Are you telling your clients or your investors to get in or get out? Right. And my answer is always, well, neither get in nor get out is an investing strategy. That's just gambling on a moment in time. Yeah. And um, investing should never be about a moment in time. It should always be a process over time. To your point about quad analysis, the way I look at it in terms of cycle analysis and phases of the cycle. Um, and if you, I think, take that slightly more, for lack of a better word, sort of subtle approach, just sort of staying in, make sure you sort of jive with the way the cycles work, understanding the contrarian nature of investor sentiment, understanding that it peaks and troughs in the market cycle. If you were fo purely focused on the economic data, you'd probably be heading in the wrong direction. Right. Um, and it's just uh, the history of the way cycles work. Mm -hmm. there, there's, no, there's no perfect roadmap that that provides. Mm -hmm. if, it, if it there was, then this would be really easy. Yeah, but that, I mean, what you just said about, okay, get the economic cycle right, that's just, for starters, right. the behavioral component of the market, and then, and then getting the market itself and using its signals. I mean, these, these things all have to go together, and that's what makes it so, so tough. And I'll <laughs> tell you, the behavioral component, I'm 33 years in this business now, I've always said that if you could nail that, you almost don't need a lot of the other fundamentals. Some of the biggest extreme moves yeah. from peak to trough, you know, at, at inflection points, at, at peaks and of troughs, have had so much to do with just that tipping point of psychology. Oh, big time. Yeah. Well, I mean, on which I screwed up because I didn't have the government data, but 
the CFTC futures and options data, the net short position in S&P index and e had its biggest net short position in the history of the data series at the first week of February. So okay. people short, you know, people came out of shell shock December and shorted every up move for six weeks. Yeah. So our people being, we use looking at non-commercial, so you're looking at the hedge fund community effectively. Right. So they delta hedged all the way up to the lower highs. And then whammo, Russell stops going up there. And here we are. You know, Russell's down 14% yeah. from August of last year. Yeah, we, we've, had, we've had a large cap bias now for about a year and a half, almost two years. Yeah, that's been smart. Um, and, you know, it's a few times in that span where I kind of felt that little bit of a knot in my stomach. Yeah, you got during quad two. <laughs> you well, you, you, you had sort of a, a, a pre-tax cut lift in small caps under this notion that they had a higher net effective tax rate, so therefore yeah. they were bigger beneficiaries. The problem was a record high percentage of small caps aren't profitable. So if you have no profits, doesn't matter what your tax rate does, you, you don't get the yeah. benefit because you don't have profits to tax. And, and then I think just more recently, um, small caps got a lift coming off the Christmas Eve low. Yeah. That's where uh, you know, the value was found. It was kind of the reverse momentum trade. But still think when you look at- uh, Reverse momentum, yeah. You, you, I just think the underlying <laughs> fundamentals, everything from the, the highest percentage of companies that are zombie companies and you know, aggressive levels yeah. of debt, um, I think, and, and the weakness that you saw in the credit markets tied to energy was felt in, in small caps. I, I felt more confident this time in sort of riding through that short period and you of small cap out performance. You should have. I mean, you're the only person, first of all, uh, for those of you that haven't read it yet, maybe it's just coming out today. But Liz Ann's the only strategist that wrote, that writes about maximum drawdowns, okay? Max drawdowns over multiple periods. And you were not in small caps during a 27% drawdown. That's a, you, you don't come back from a move it's like that. It's hard to come back from a move like that, yeah. I mean, that was, from August 30th to December the 24th, the Russell was down 27.5%. That was when the, I was calling them the popping of the micro bubbles, kind of the rolling yeah. bear market thing, started to become a bigger deal. You yeah. know, you saw it in the short vol implosion in February, and you saw it in the fangs, and you saw it in, you know, Bitcoin and other cryptos. But then it started to morph into EM yeah. and, you know, U.S. small caps. And even, I think, at the Christmas Eve low, you had... 60% of the S&P was in bear market territory. So, yeah, big time. So we, ha we had, even if you're, you know, if you're dogmatic about using the minus 20% to define a bear market, um, we, we had plenty of them last year. <laughs> we had plenty. <laughs> well, now the Russell's down 14% from that same point, yeah. so they're only 6 percentage of points yeah. away. And you look at the market a couple of ways. The S&P's 5% off its highs, or the Russell's 14% off its highs. I mean, there's obviously a lot of different ways that people characterize the market. I'm going to get into some questions here. I've, I've had this question a couple of times. I don't know if you have an opinion on it or not, but Lizen, what do you think about gold here? Um, don't, don't cover it um, in any kind of day-to-day -day way. We at times broadly will maybe make a tactical, express a tactical view, but it's typically just limited to a couple percent in portfolios. Yeah. And that's going to vary depending on where you are in the risk spectrum. I think generally it's been a better hedge against sort of um, policy uncertainty and instability globally than it has kind of a traditional inflation hedge. Um, so, uh, you know, I think gold is somewhat interesting on that policy uncertainty yep. hedge component, but it's just not an area that we have a lot of, you know, resources uh, devoted to. Right now we have sort of a neutral tactical rating on it, which just means if you have a normal amount of gold in your portfolio, keep yep. that amount, uh, you know, N not above or below that. Okay, I'm gonna fire these off to you. Um, with the Fed buying, where on the yield curve will the Fed buy the most? Where will they buy the most? I don't know. I mean, people our, are really trying to figure that out too, because yeah. people, at least I say, have been buying treasuries across the curve for like six months. So now people are trying to get a little smarter before the curve steepens again. If the Fed, yeah, goes. I, I'm, you know, we, we have my my counterpart on the fixed income side is is Kathy Jones. So okay. She's our chief fixed income strategist and. I, it's probably been like seven or eight years ago now when Schwab hired her. It was the greatest day in my life because I no longer had to pretend like I knew anything about the fixed income side of things. So <laughs> I now have somebody really smart I can look to and say, okay, what's the fixed income group's view? Yeah. And um, not so much from a what is the Fed going to be buying, but our recommendation inside from a duration perspective has been on the kind of short to, to medium end of the spectrum, sort of in the five-year yep. range is sort of what we feel near term is sort of the sweet spot from a duration perspective. I like that too. I mean, twos and fives inverted today too. Uh, Lizanne, what do you think of the all-weather portfolio approach by Ray Dalio? 
Um, I don't know if I've seen what that encompasses in terms of uh, allocation to various asset classes. It's kind of, it's, well, not kind of. I mean, his, it's, it's similar in methodology to the four quadrants. So it's saying if you're in negative growth, then you allocate to duration, or you buy long-term bonds, you buy bond proxies, utilities, et cetera. Uh, when you're in quad one or two, you, you short all that and you buy the rest. I, I think approaches like that generally make a lot of sense, except the problem is that there's no overlay as it relates to the individual investor in terms of their own personal circumstances. Exactly. So yeah. I could have an incredibly high conviction view of what I think the, the you know four key broad asset classes are going to do. But what I would tell a 22-year-old investor just inherited $10 million, they don't need the money, they don't need to earn income on it. You know, They go bungee jumping on the weekend. They're not going to obsess over even a 15 or 20 percent drop in their portfolio versus what I would tell a 75-year-old investor that has a nest egg. They, they can't afford to lose any of it, and they need mm -hmm. to earn income on it. So one view about where I think we are in the market, two totally different messages depending on the investor. Yeah. And I think that... So that's sometimes why I have trouble with people who answer the question in any kind of definitive way. You know, how are you telling investors to allocate their assets right now? Um, well, who's the investor? Mm -hmm. And then I'd need to ask 20 questions on top of that to really define what the cycle, where we are in the cycle, should mean from an allocation perspective to each of those investors. Yeah, it changes big time. I, the, my best proxy for that uh, real time is looking at my wife's old 401k. She worked at Deutsche Bank, so she's got this beautifully huge, I guess what you call a Trump, Trumpian uh, huge uh, 401k that I uh, look at. And, and to see how she expresses my views is just like over the years, because we've been married for, uh, if I get the years wrong, she's going to shoot me. But long <laughs> enough, uh, where I've seen like when she was just coming up, you know, effectively just getting out of Wall Street and how she would do it and now how she does it. It's just, it's, sure. it's completely per personal changed. Personal circumstances. Yeah. I, you know, <laughs> we never, my husband and I never make all or nothing decisions, but at certain times in, in 07, our, the reflection of, of my quite pessimistic view was in the kids' um, 529. They were. Because we were close enough to the point of the oldest going to college that we thought, all right, maybe we want to be a bit more extreme um, with with that money yeah. uh, at the time. So again, even there was a, a function of that po that piece of our our investments was one that had a time horizon difference yeah. relative to other pieces. So decisions you make for that different time horizon piece might be very different than you might make in a 401k or an IRA. Yeah, doing it with real ammo really changes. It makes it, 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 makes it real. It makes you know? it real. It's just, uh, it those does. 529s are awesome. For those of you that have kids, you got to do it. I mean, yeah, it's, a simple, it's, the it's the biggest no-brainer alongside your 401k uh, is to have 529s. And you can have one for every kid. So if you have like four kids like I do, you, got a lot, you get a lot of dough you put and there. And if you, if you don't use it all for their education, I just found this out because I'm really interested in um, Stanford has a program, Harvard has a program down the road. I'm not, I'm not now announcing that I'm retiring from Schwab anytime soon. <laughs> but in the case of Stanford, it's the Distinguished Career Institute. You, you get to go back to school as a, as a student. You get to just take any class you want. Uh, and you don't necessarily have to take the test. So it's kind of best of all worlds. Yeah. It's just a learning experience. But even that, I just found out, something like that is covered by... Um, what what I always thought of was my kids 529. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. So it wow. can be used for education uh, by the family, not wow. just specifically tied. So that I, was enlightening. I, I think that could be a very bad thing for me at that stage of my career to go back to Yale and engage with Yale economists. Uh, oh, well, boy. yeah. Oh, so that's boy. a that's a no. that's a different. Uh, <laughs> I don't I don't think you would know. I don't think Yale does it yet. So far, I think it's it's only Stanford Yale has its own uh, reputational problems to deal with these days. Um, yeah, let's see here. Um, let's see. What? Oh, man, these are some questions here that are a little bit uh, repeating themselves. Okay, um, Chinese economy. If the Chinese economic releases are BS, Lizanne, I heard that there are they're, they're way better ways to gauge China's economy. What do you do? Um, well, Jeff Kleintop is my colleague who covers non-U.S., so yeah. he spends more of his day in the weeds of, of non-U.S. economic data. And, you know, the, no one disagrees with the notion that the, that the data reporting is, is somewhat bogus. But uh, one of the things, and I'll, maybe I'll put it in the context of just having been there in November. I, right. I did a week. I did cool. uh, two days in Hong Kong, one day in Shanghai, and then two days in Singapore. And it was interesting to hear from 
sort of local Chinese investors that, that have assets with, with Schwab. That's who audiences mm -hmm. were. And in some cases, there were events that were more, I wouldn't even call them prospecting events, but educational But rich events. Chinese people. Yeah, wealthy yeah. Chinese people. Yeah. And um, so they had a couple of interesting perspectives. One, with regard to trade, felt that it was a, a game that was a short game on the part of the United States and a much longer game on the part of, of China. Mm -hmm. that, but also that they, they had one eye on, on trade with the US, but maybe a, a more open eye on the Belt and Road Initiative and how to work with, with the rest of the world outside the Great US point. to kind of expand that initiative, continuing to morph their economy away from being mm -hmm. low cost exporter of cheap manufactured good to the rest of the world to adjust to being more of a consumer led Economy, and you're seeing that with the the ways they are attempting to stimulate their economy from the recent doldrums. You know, gone are the days where they just go back to that investment-led stimulus. They are trying Brutal. to do things that are in support of kind uh, of the consumer part of their economy. So you know, you are starting to see some green shoots, whether you can believe the data or not. But but that would be that would be a positive story from a global growth perspective if if yep. we if that lift is uh, is for real. Well, it's and, and it's it's surreal in terms of the opportunity. I mean, you look at the <laughs> south or the eastern part of China. I mean, so poor per capita consumption can go through the roof. Yep. Um, great book called China's Asian Dream um, was written recently on that front, and that's that's their long game. I mean, they're not going to uh, lose sight of that. I think that's yep. a really important point. Um, let's see here. Uh, Given current low Fed rates, Lizanne, how do you see a recession or significant slowdown playing out if in case that happens? Is, is that sort of the ammunition question? <laughs> Does the Fed have ample ammunition? Yeah. Sort of? um, well, I think may, maybe less so in terms of Fed funds, although I think if it's a garden variety recession, I don't know if you'd have to see Fed funds rate cut so dramatically um, I, I didn't love to hear uh, John Williams talk about, yeah, we'd consider negative rates. I, I don't think that that's had the intended effect where it's been instituted in the past. If anything, it's almost reinforced sort of deflationary mindset when, you, when you've got you know, any central bank still treating the patient like it's in the trauma room. Um, I, I don't think that that sort of sends a message of confidence throughout the system. <laughs> but what is clearly the case is that the balance sheet is, is, is just as important a tool and will be used as aggressively as Fed funds. So we can't just think of the level of the Fed funds rate as the only tool that the Fed can use in a recession. That, that lever of QE will be pulled um, again, probably in my lifetime, as a, as a sort of common lever that is pulled during yeah. economic What else are they going to do? I mean, um, I get maybe the last question. I get this question a lot. I think he's got a pretty good reputation. Uh, I don't know him. Uh, Michael Hartnett thinks the S&P will get over 3,000 based purely on flows. What do you think about that argument? Well, we only recently have seen the pickup in flows. Uh, it was quite surprising, actually, uh, the dearth of flows coming out of the Christmas Eve lows that this rally really, until recently, was not a function of flows. You looked at commitment to trader reports, you didn't see it in large mm -hmm. speculators, you didn't see it in small speculators, you didn't see it in any kind of aggressive repositioning on the part of, of hedge funds. So um, is it enough now? Um, if we have a, a more days like we saw on Friday, I, I, don't, I don't think flows alone get you there. I think you would, you would, you would have to see investors chasing another sort of momentum leg up in the market to generate the kind of flows in and of itself would, I think, take you to those levels. Well, you t I mean, a lot of these arguments are made by, well, there are plenty of people on Wall Street, not to say that Hartnett, I don't think he's a permable at all, uh, but people just feel naturally a certain way when the VIX is between 10 and 14, and then bang, you're at 17, counting 18 on the VIX on Friday, and people's mood changes instantaneously. So I it's also think that you know you, you you didn't need flows to define the entire bull market that we've had. You know, on a net cumulative basis, even including domestic ETFs, um, there's not a single dollar of net new money that's come into the no. uh, domestic equities since pre-financial crisis. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's certainly possible that you could see flows become a bigger part of the positive story, but there are plenty of other scenarios that could get you to S&P 3000 uh, mm -hmm. without flows being a big part of that. You could also have outflows take you to S&P 2000. You, I mean, certainly, <laughs> you certainly can. And, and I think that the, 
I don't know if it was, I remember seeing data that it was record outflows and I, uh, you know, most of the data I see is at best on a weekly basis, certainly yep. not on a daily basis. So I guess it would be the week including the Christmas Eve uh, low. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that marked the end of a week's worth of data, but mm -hmm. uh, but you you did not see sort of a commensurate pickup with the rally in, right. in flows until very recently. I mean, if anything, I mean, some people poo-poo this when I show it because I guess they've been told by somebody on Wall Street that you know falling volume doesn't matter. Uh, that's, that doesn't compute in my process. But um, look at uh, Friday's volume, guys. If you can show that, I mean. If you just measure and map it daily, I look at total equity market volume, including dark pool, and just measure and map like the rate of change. I mean, it was up 14% versus the prior day, and it's up 17% versus the one-year average. Um, that is typical. That, it's, it's interesting. The S&P has been down uh, 12 of the last 18 trading days. And on any day that's greater than 1% decline, those are the volume numbers. On the way up, volume is just going away. So it's, it, the flow argument, I think, is a tenuous one, generally speaking. I mean, I think you got to really kind of get into the tapestry of the machine these days and say, well, what's, you know, what's really going on here? And also look at, at what happens in the first hour of trading versus the last hour of trading. And yeah. in the case of ETFs, um, what's happening outside market hours and inside market hours. Uh, the, the, the real story is a lot more complicated than, than just the headline story. And you wouldn't have said that probably five, ten right. years ago. Yep. That's, that's the new game that we're in, right? Yep. And you're not fighting it, it doesn't look no, like you no. can't. No. <laughs> well, thanks for not fighting anything, really. I mean, you've had an open mind throughout. As long as okay. I remember following you, you've, you've, you've been one of the most flexible in terms of going from bearish to bullish oh, to I, bullish I, to bearish, I, I've no been on. I've been on every end of the spectrum. Yeah. I'm not dogmatic. I, I try to be objective and fact-based and yeah no politics you know, i didn't no, hear one no, 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 uh, no, no, no. one I, thing i yeah. don't think you need to yeah. um, i Good. think there's a need to avoid it if you can these days but I, I to me it doesn't it doesn't really color my perspective on where we are not in the cycle and what investors yeah. should do and um, thank you for not trying to no, uh, no, bait no. me into yeah, no. <laughs> Even though we're in the apolitical state of Connecticut, and both uh, <laughs> both Liz Ann and I live, she lives in Darien, I live in Westport, there, there would never be a political opinion there, so you'd have nothing to worry about <laughs> anytime that you want to listen to us. Uh, again, she's data-driven, so my thanks for uh, listening in on our conversation, and definitely thank you for your questions.